Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ray Point and I'm going to be doing the introduction um, on behalf of NUMR. Then I'm going to hand over the floor to Rachel Laws who will curate and lead the whole process. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here today. I'm tremendously excited. I'm Rachel Laws, uh, you probably know me in connection with semiotics. Um, I wrote this book, um, which was published in March 2020, called Using Semiotics in Marketing. And shortly after it was published in March, um, Ray, um, who organises these fabulous um, webinars through the NeuroMar platform, contacted me to ask me if um, I'd like to organise a read-along group for the book. And that invitation turned into quite an adventure. Uh, that adventure, that I want to share with you today, and I hope that you will then take a similar adventure of your own. So let me tell you the story. There we go. So it was in April this year, what happened was that a group, quite large actually group of market researchers and insight professionals, none of them particularly junior, all people who um, were um, entitled to feel that they knew what they were doing with um, market research, embarked upon something new. They came to semiotics as either complete beginners or as relative newcomers who hadn't really um, made semiotics a core part of their offering up until now. And together what they did was read this book over several weeks in a group read along with the author. The book makes a big promise. This book promised to give all these people some real, real world skills in semiotics, skills which were strong enough to become the foundations of a career, of a professional offering in semiotics, even if they were trying semiotics for the very first time, as is the case with some of the people that you'll meet here today. And that's a big ask, right? So that's what the book promises to do. And in pursuit of this goal, every week, over a period of several weeks, our group completed quite a lot of challenges. So there are um, activities throughout this book which will help the reader to develop their own practice in semiotics. So they completed various challenges each week. And while they were doing it, they developed their own individual projects using semiotics as well. And of those groups, six of those people kind of made it all the way to the finish line here in November and have made posters that exists to showcase their newfound skills. And here are those people. I am so excited and proud to be able to present this work today. This um, read-along group uh, has resulted in an exhibition and as a result, some new semiotics has been born. And we now have new original research to publish by all of these people, by Manisha Dixit, Ajanta Roy, Joanne McNeish, Teresa Jones, Chloe Wangu, and of course Ray Pointer himself, who I've persuaded to um, to um, kind of put himself on the line there by um, by participating and making a poster just along with everybody else. I want to offer huge congratulations to all of these people because doing something for the first time is always a bit nerve wracking. Semiotics is um, quite a sophisticated tool. It's not like um, you know, plugging some numbers into um, SPSS and hoping that they come out right at the other end. You've really got to do the heavy lifting of the thinking yourself. And it's quite a tricky thing to embark on, which is the reason why I wrote this book, explaining what to do. And it's particularly kind of nerve wracking. If you can imagine doing something like that, which is a new skill, it's creative, it involves lots of new concepts. And being told that you've got to publish your work and show the world what you've done, including to your business peers as well, and people whose opinions you respect, that takes a considerable degree of courage. And so that's why I'm so proud to be able to, um, to have the opportunity to, to share all this work with you today. I've probably, I'm, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and therefore I've probably personally worked on, I guess, somewhere between two and 3,000 pieces of semiotics. The, the one that you get to at number 3000 is not the same as your very first try. And it's the first try that really, it's the one that you remember forever. And it's the one that um, takes um, a, quite a bit of courage to put on a public platform. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of our brave new artists and new thinkers whose work we're going to view today. Before I introduce these posters individually and speak to our artists individually, I want to just say a few words about their contents. These 
six posters, even though there's only a few of them, they just um, demonstrate considerable um, variety in the way that they approach semiotics. So there's, if you know anything about semiotics, you probably know about the kind of bottom-up approach, which is where you um, identify and decode semiotic signs and symbols. This is a kind of classical approach. It's a great place to begin with semiotics. Um, you're going to see this in two um, works by Ajanta Roy, um, who analyzes the color green and its meaning in India. And then we're, you'll see that the same approach again, this bottom-up approach that includes color in the work of Ray Pointer, in, in which he looks at the way that um, business consultancies um, use colour and shape to make themselves appear more um, authoritative and trustworthy. There's another aspect of semiotics though, which often people don't get into until later in their careers, which is called top-down semiotics. It's very much informed by anthropology and it's about using semiotic thinking to answer some big questions about the way that we live now. And so um, I'm delighted to say that we um, have some of this exciting top-down thinking in the work of uh, Manika Dixit, who has produced um, some very um, um, intriguing um, um, exploratory um, sort of investigation of the way that people are, are arranging their home workspaces. Um, and then um, Joanne um, has insights concerning retail, but also concerning physical materials that we might use to communicate with each other. Chloe's work um, concerns branding a whole continent and you will see her bring together both top-down and bottom-up approaches in one single piece of work. And finally, of all these um, pieces, perhaps the most um, challenging uh, and consequently one of, the most, one of the most brave pieces of work is that by Teresa Jones, which at first glance it looks like um, straightforward um, quantitative uh, reportage. Um, in fact, Teresa thinks deeply about how to look at quantitative data from a semiotic point of view and when we do this it turns out that there's more than one story in Teresa's poster that one will become visible and then the other story will become visible as we put on our semiotic hat and then take it off again but I'm preempting myself now and so what I will do then is just um, share with you one quote before we move on to these posters and um, and here it is. This was an email that one of our contributors sent me last night as we were making the last minute preparations for this exhibition. And here is what she said. I have been avoiding semiotics for all these years. When I saw the book read along with Ray, I decided to join. And I'm so glad I did that I have managed to get a poster out of reading the book shows how effective the book reading has been. That's what we've achieved with this group. And that, I hope, is what I would like to achieve for everybody who's watching. Semiotics is for you and you can do it. And now, without any further ado, let's look at the first of um, the artists we're celebrating today. Uh, Manisha Dixit is from Singapore. And let's uh, take a look at her poster. I'll briefly introduce it. And then I'll invite Manisha herself to um, talk a little bit about her work and how semiotics informed it. So Manisha's poster is called Theatre of Work. And she's laid out this poster in a way which is um, quite easy to read. So we can see that she's um, managed to identify some, um, I would say, semiotic signs. So we've got two contrasting images of desks here. Um, one from the 1980s, which we'll take a closer look at in the moment. And one more recently, which looks like it might have been set up for gaming. And so here we've got people um, filling um, valuable space with tech with perhaps similar ambitions and rather um, different results. So she's identified some semiotic signs here, but is also recognising that those signs aren't just floating around in space individually, they're actually combining in a meaningful way to form a code. And that code has to do with the transformation of um, a domestic space into a workspace. Uh, as so many of us who've started to work from home during the pandemic have gradually imported technologies and signs and symbols of the workspace into our homes in order to create some kind of, um, shall we say, um, convincing backdrop that allows us to um, uh, do a performance for other people of look how um, diligent and professional we are. 
So what I'll do now is, um, here's, here's Manisha and here's a quote then. So she says, I observed how my friends and myself have transformed our work areas. In Singapore, where I live, IKEA has seen large queues as a result of all the home refurbishing people are doing. And now let me um, ask Manisha, Ray, can we unmute Manisha so we can have some, some commentary from her on her poster? Manisha, you should be able to unmute yourself, I think. Yes, hi. Hey, Manisha, thank you being for so much for this wonderful poster. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely enjoyed it. Uh, actually, what was interesting for me was that uh, when we started the book uh, read along, this was just uh, as we were hitting COVID. And I was hearing all these stories around me from friends, it was in social media, um, and everywhere. And um, I wasn't really paying attention. I just looked at some of them and I was kind of amused by them, etc. cetera. Um, and then there was something in the book that really struck me. And in the book, you talk about this whole idea of looking through uh, and looking at. And that the fact that we kind of have a tendency to look through things, um, and that kind of really made me stop for a moment and really consider what was going around and pay a little bit more attention to what uh, all of this means. And that, that's really what triggered this uh, sort of uh, exploration and journey. Um, and I was just really struck by, you know, this idea of uh, the physicality of what's going on at home and uh, the workspaces um, and very much like you know it's about uh, using uh, stagecraft and lighting and all of that in theater and you find that now happening with uh, our home spaces as well so I think that's really what kind of got me uh, very intrigued and you know the whole idea of uh, a sense of audience which we've had possibly when we do presentations or present our work but in a very different kind of way now um yeah so that's really what i've got in my poster thank you this is brilliant i love what you have here and i think that you've got something worth pursuing because what your work does i'm just flipping backwards so we can get another look at your whole poster what you are um, um, approaching here is a very deep question about um, privacy and um, uh, this pandemic has um, caused us to kind of redraw the boundaries of privacy you know so that at one time um, there was work life and there was home life and there was the home and the office and they were completely separate and we've been seeing we've been seeing those two things merge into each other for quite some time now but i think pandemic and the kind of whole work from home trend that accompanied it has really accelerated that so that we now it's no longer clear whether your private time is private whether your private space is private these things are qualitatively changing and I think you've tapped into something quite large here that I hope you're going to pursue in the future. Are you going to keep up with semiotics now? Mm. Oh yes, definitely. I mean, um, you're absolutely right, like home spaces and what do they mean uh, to people and how we're crafting those is, uh, is something that's really interesting to look at. But I think also like, just so if I, if I think about my work so far, um, I'm a qualitative researcher in, in the Asia Pacific region, which is fairly complex and culturally quite uh, diverse. And in all of my work, um, I, you know, I collect quite a bit of uh, material and including visual material, which again, I've been ignoring so far. Mm. And so I think for me, this is really kind of, um, adds on layers to um, the, the kind of work that I can do and the kind of uh, output and the nuances to understanding that complexity. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, certainly I'm kind of looking forward to, you know, continuing on that journey. It's fantastic, Manisha, thank you. And I hope that you'll say some more of that in our discussion session at the end as well. Thank you. And um, let's now turn um, to Ajanta Roy. 
So Ajanta has taken a different approach. As I mentioned, what we've got in Manisha's work is a kind of top-down approach where we're kind of asking some quite anthrop anthropological questions about the changing world that we live in. The other more um, classical approach to semiotics is a bottom-up bottom approach where you start with individual signs and symbols and you ask what they mean. And um, Ajanta has um, picked on the colour green and decided to um, ask some questions about how does it function, for example, in brand marks. Now, green is um, a favourite colour amongst all the brands that I work with. They often want to claim that they are um, being especially um, natural or healthy or something along those lines. But it would be tempting to let our clients think that that's all there is to green. But in fact, there's much more to it. And I'm very intrigued by Janta's work because she has a good understanding of different cultures within India. And so she can tell a story about what green means in India that is much more nuanced than most of us would be able to achieve. Ajanta, would you like to tell us about your poster? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so very much. This is Ajanta Roy. Uh, basically, I'm born and brought up in Bombay and I live in Kolkata. The mention of these two cities are very important because they're culturally different, demographically different as well. Now, of course, uh, India being India, we weren't very sure as to what would really happen, you know, during the pandemic and during the lockdown. So taking forward uh, whatever Manisha said, even I was in a fix, you know, wondering what's going to happen. So we started doing online studies. Lo and behold, I just got into a study, which was an agricultural study with farmers. And I had to speak to farmers and retailers on agricultural products that they kind of buy. Now, I wanted to mention before this, since I've been practicing as a qualitative research consultant for quite some time, I didn't know the importance, you know, of colors, signs and symbols, because India, once again, has a lot of emphasis on colors, signs, symbols. And there was semiotics, you know, which was maybe a small part of the discussion guide, which we were supposed to be executing and analyzing and putting in our presentations. So incidentally, it was during that time that I got to know about the book. And of course, it was using semiotics and marketing and I couldn't get the book, but I thought, let me explore. So it was kind of parallelly happening. Now, this particular study had a methodology wherein we interacted with the farmers and we wanted to understand. In fact, the clients wanted to understand the impact of colors and symbols on brands. And these were agricultural brands dealing in insecticides, pesticides, fungicides. So it wasn't very easy being India, the connectivity, talking to farmers online. So taking all that into account, we did brilliantly well. And of course, we realized, which the poster also depicts, that black was kind of a no-no. There were clients who had black in their logo and they also had you know some shades of black which came out as indicators of death negativity being inauspicious glooming and bringing in depression this was loud and clear and green on the other hand left a very positive note now coming down to red red was again a sign which spoke about positivity auspiciousness happiness danger etc now, coming down to green, as we all know, it depicted, you know, the green bangles are worn specially by the Maharashtrians in India, which depicts positivity and the symbol of a married woman. Green is always part of worship. Green is part of Ayurveda, part of, you know, the uh, military, which, of course, is nationally and internationally there. Then you have this health, environment, relaxation, etc. After this, we actually matched up a few logos and have depicted a few organizations which are national and international dealing in these products. Incidentally, we found that they had developed a pinch of green in their logos. And there was an extremely positive association of the farmers, the retailers, talking purely about positivity. In fact, I am very sure some of you must be aware of NABAD, which is National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, an apex body, central government uh, owned body in India, which plays a very important role in the agricultural sector. Lo and behold, I just realized that they had a black logo. Slowly and gradually, NABAD today also has a logo which is green in color. They're pretty close to the farmers. So it was found very clearly that green denotes positivity, wealth, celebration, success, good luck, 
auspiciousness and lot more now okay. ultimately this yeah just one sec this kind of a uh, of an insight was helpful to the clients and i'm done yes please sorry all right amazing ajanta you're fantastic i love this project and um by the way, people, you know, Ajanta had some trouble getting her, her um, book um, delivered to her. It was rather delayed. And she put together her piece of semiotics based just on attending the live read along sessions. Um, and so I kind of want to award extra credit here <laughs> for determination <laughs> as much as anything else. A, a great project and um, something which merits lots more um, investigation agenda which i really hope you keep up with i would love to see you kind of really um kind of become an expert in semiotic writing on the meaning of color in india that would be fantastic and please hang around for the discussion section at the end sure sure thank you so very much you're very welcome and now let's move to um joanne joanne mcneish is in canada joanne um used a um top-down approach similar to the one we see used by manish dixit um, here, Joanne's uh, work is called We Are Doing the Best We Can. And her project um, specifically involves paper signs which were um, posted in the windows of stores and businesses as various countries entered pandemic related lockdown. Now, I think that this is quite um, deep work that has implications for, um, it helps us to understand the relationships of. Um, small businesses and retailers to their customers. But Joanne's also very interested in paper and writing media as well. And so um, let me hand over to her. Let's just put her on the screen for a moment. There we go, there's Joanne. Joanne, would you like to join us and say a few words about your work? Absolutely. Um, so I wanted to actually say I'm a quantitative researcher. So I'm used to lots of numbers and statistical programs that do the work behind my back. So I was startled with the the effort that this required, but in a really wonderful way. So I encourage everyone to, to use this book because for me, it was a lovely step-by-step -step on the first read of how to jump into this method uh, because I, was, I truly was scared, like, oh my gosh, I, I can't do this, but it really was wonderful. And I'm gonna take it back to my quantitative work because I think I've allowed the statistics to drive sometimes the analysis, maybe not really grasp the notion of thinking deeply. So my work is the intersection of paper and digital. And I always ask the question, why do we still have paper in this digital world? Well, thank goodness for paper, because across the world, the go-to technology was in fact this wonderful, simple, what do I have on hand, pieces of paper. And so in my poster, you can actually see the cash register tape. They literally tore it off the cash register. But what struck me in all of this, as, as many of you, we were restricted to what we could do, as I walked around, it was, what's happening here? These are businesses, and they're used to presenting themselves professionally with branded materials, uh, that they're at a distance from us as consumers, they have no worries or concerns, they have people to manage. And suddenly what the COVID pandemic revealed here uh, and I'm in Toronto, Canada, which is a large urban uh, center in Canada, was that uh, digital failed us. The signs pretty well continue to show products, but here we saw the signs reaching out and saying, literally the title is, we're doing the best we can. And you literally can see the panic and the crisis and the, the leveling and the meeting between a large, small, medium-sized business and their customers. And, and people trying to just communicate with each other and explain in the midst of a time when retailers were struggling to figure out what to do. Because we, maybe we've almost forgotten that first stage where, what is this across the world? We all supposed to go home if we're lucky enough to have a home to go to. And, and then there's some new behaviors re required at the retail stores. Um, but it's, it's what an extraordinary journey. And thank you, Rachel, because I, I wouldn't have tried if I hadn't done the course and read the book. And now what I'd like to do is do so much more of this because in quantitative, I wouldn't have seen this. I, I would have gotten customer attitudes and, and I'll still do that as well, but I wouldn't have seen this wonderful, very loud message from retailers. It's like, we're, we're trying, we're, we're doing the best and we're just like you. 
And by the way, I didn't see that as a fault, that in fact, standing professionally is really important as companies. But I also conclude that showing that you're human and doing the best you can in a crisis like this is very acceptable as well. I, th I think you're so right. I, lo I love this work. And I think that um, one of the things that I, I try to advise brands to do when they're working on their relationships with consumers is it's, it's really important to sort of position yourself as a business as being on the same team as your customer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That look, we're yes. on the same side here. And I think these it kind of, there's a certain innocence and intimacy and freshness about these handwritten um, signs, which are um, doing that job really well, which larger brands could learn something from that, I think. Mm -hmm. I absolutely mm. agree. Yes. I, and I think that was the one thing or, or the next thing that we can take from this, that brands are, failed, are often afraid to be sort of maximally creative by returning to simplicity. And I think what some symbiotics can do is actually have you go back and rethink what you, what you think you know. That, that's for me the biggest thought is that I thought I knew because the stats gave it to me or the quantitative research gave it to me. Wow, there's so much I didn't know. It's fantastic. What a ringing endorsement. Thank you, Joan. I'm so thrilled for you. I hope you have a lifelong journey with some of the so I hope you deliver endless rewards for you as it has for me. Let's move on and meet our next artist, Teresa Jones. Teresa Jones is British and she um, has been conducting her own um, research um, over the last several months, which she did alongside the, um, the semiotics, read along in the semiotics project, with the result that she's got some data here, which at first glance, if you're used to looking at quantitative reports, at first glance, it might seem that there's a straightforward enough story to um, be discovered in this data, right? So what this chart is telling you is that um, it essentially, Teresa will tell you herself, but essentially it asked about a thousand Londoners, how long are you going to be able to cope with lockdown, right? And what we can see is that some people feel they'll be able to endure it for only a few weeks and some people are kind of optimistic about being able to put up with it for a very long period of time. Now we could just take that at face value, but I, am, I think that um, uh, with a semiotic hat on, Teresa discovered another story in that data, which shifts in and out of view, depending on whether or not you're using a semiotic perspective to analyze it. Teresa, tell us something about your work, if you would. And also, do you want to take yourself off mute to do that? Hi. Hey, Teresa. Um, hey, thanks, talk to us hi. about your work. Yes. So um, similarly to Manisha, actually, what really struck me in your book was the notion of looking through and looking at. And then I noticed that, you know, it's a perfect time for us to be doing this activity and perfect timing for your book to come out in a, at a time when people are looking at themselves in a very different light and are looking at different aspects of themselves in a different light. So in April, I ran an independent quant study looking into the hopes, anxieties and expectations of over a thousand diverse Londoners. I'm normally a qualitative researcher, but I wanted to use a quant lens to tell this story. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, usually in quant research, we take people's responses at face value. But when we apply a semiotic lens, we begin to look at the way that respondents construct a version of their reality, which is designed to make them appear a certain way. So the data here reveals that in a crisis, it seems that people actually might lean more heavily on traditional gender roles, which they were previously leaving behind. I found here that men were more likely to be cast in the role of providers than women. And they were elsewhere in my study, they were actually making bigger household purchases, spending more on upgrading entertainment subscriptions, and they typically lived with more people in the household. They were also more driven to maintain a sense of routine by going to work and choosing to continue to do so, even when someone in the household displayed symptoms of COVID-19. And what we can see here in this poster is that for whatever reason, men, especially white men and younger men, are highly motivated to represent themselves as people who are especially able to cope and endure lockdown. And so they had a unique interest in telling this story about themselves. This is what I find to be so fascinating about your work, Teresa, because as you rightly say, when we look at this data, we've got choices in the matter of how we understand it. Right? So we can either say, when we look at the right-hand side of this chart, 
we, we could, if we choose, take these people at face value, right? So when they say, I feel very confident, we can take that to mean that they feel very confident. But also, as you rightly say, what semiotics will invite you to do is to observe that when people are telling you things, even if it's in a survey response, that they're engaging in a kind of performance, that they are representing themselves and they're representing the world that they live in and they're representing a certain version of reality and they're inviting you to believe in it. They're kind of doing a little bit of theatre. And as you astutely point out, there's a certain theatre or performance of, shall we say, resilience and being able to cope, which is um, disproportionately noticeable amongst young white men. Isn't that fascinating? I find that really fascinating. Really? So what I, I uh, go on, Trisha. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think as well, what was interesting, especially about the 25 to 34 age group as a whole, is that they actually were the most anxious out of everyone and had a real difficulty in um, spending their time that was unstructured. So they struggled with maintaining a routine, even though they said that, yeah, I can cope until late October. There was still this underlying tension there. That's absolutely fascinating as well, isn't it? So, you know, kind of in the, in the same breath almost. On the one hand, they'll tell you I feel really anxious. And at the same time, they'll construct a version of themselves which is highly able to cope, get things organised, you know, is resilient, will be able to manage with the pandemic no, no longer how it goes on. It's really interesting, isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you for this exercise. And I hope to continue applying more semiotics in the future to research projects. Keep doing it, Teresa. We need more people in semiotics who really engage with quantitative data and have interesting stories to tell about it. Okay, and let's move on to our next artist, Chloe Wang Wu. Chloe is very interesting. She's based in the United States. We'll take a look at the detail of this poster in a moment. Her project is called Branding a Continent and it concerns the ways that entire continents <coughs> are represented using visual signs and symbols um, and also bits and pieces of language and other types of design decisions to, um, to sell whole large regions of the world to outsiders. Now, I, I'm going to ask Chloe herself to explain the work in just a moment, but I think what we can see here is that Chloe um, discovered um, some work on an Africa code that had been done by a historian and um, cleverly linked that to work that she does um, professionally, um, which helps to kind of investigate and manage international power relations. And along the way, she incorporated some bottom-up semiotics as well in the form of these very distinctive colour palettes that we see here. This is one of the most ambitious projects in this um, whole series because she combines top, um, down and bottom-up semiotic analysis and she's asking some big questions about large regions of the world. So without further ado, Chloe, if you could unmute yourself, we would love to hear you say a few words about your poster. Let's just get your lovely face up on the screen there for a few minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello there. Yes. Um, so this is actually a really interesting project for me because it was um, it was something that I was already doing for a client. Um, they had approached me to ask how they could inject some energy into their brand. Um, and this was a nonprofit that is headquartered in Ghana, but is mostly staffed, um, well, mostly run by um, women in the United States. And so it was a really interesting combination of um, audiences, um, which is always sort of a fun project to tackle. Um, and so as I was doing that project, I also uh, was in this read along. And the thing that sort of changed for me after reading this book was starting to notice sort of from a top-down um, perspective, as Rachel had said, starting to notice who the audiences were for these particular images or presentations or representations of countries, continents, etc. cetera. Um, and I think without, um, without the tools really that this book gave me, I would have continued to remain sort of oblivious to the various um, power dynamics that were at play. And I'll talk, I'll, let me talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, so the thing that's really interesting about this particular code, which I'm calling the Africa code, and is likely part of a larger code that I discovered called the Global Humanitarian Code. The thing that's really interesting about this is that the code is not necessarily for the folks who live in those countries or continents. It's for outsiders. Um, and so this, this particular code is one that is primarily used to represent Africa to Westerners, specifically American Westerners. Um, and where power dynamics sort of come in is there are um, there are many different camps of people who are interested in representing Africa as a continent, for example. We have people who are outside of Africa who are interested in representing it. We have people who are inside Africa who are interested in representing it. And the curious thing is to look at um, which representation sort of takes primacy, which representation is the one that's considered standard or right. Um, and I say that in air quotes. And um, what I have found is that the uh, representation that sort of originated in Western culture has started being adopted by organizations that exist in Africa, especially when their audiences are Western. Um, and by audiences, I mean owners specifically. So that was something really interesting that I, I would not have gotten to that level of analysis without this uh, this particular project. This is excellent. I think you really have discovered something um, quite exciting here. When you see these same um, these same colours being picked out across different organisations and used for the same purpose, one which was sort of previously undetectable. And as you say, there's this kind of self-branding that goes on. You see this a lot with, um, so I do a lot of work with um, alcohol brands, for example. Alcohol brands trade very heavily on heritage, ideas of heritage and provenance. And so, um, you know, you'll have uh, brands in, in Scotland, which are kind of really heavily deploying semiotic signs for Scotland that don't necessarily reflect what Scotland itself is like, but what right. they do reflect is the expectations of the audience. And mm -hmm. I think you've got something here with similar, uh, along similar lines, haven't you, with the way that these images of Africa are being put together uh, and the strategies adopted in order to appeal to um, um, people who are remote audiences, I guess, who only have a limited knowledge to work with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I love this work so much. And um, I hope again that you'll stick around for a few minutes so that we can discuss shortly. Uh, but first of all, let's meet the last of our um, of our poster creators, Ray Pointer himself, to whom I'm so grateful for organising this whole thing. Okay, the the book read along and the exhibition both wouldn't just would not have happened without Ray's um, kind effort and um, initiative and attention throughout the series. And on top of all that, he um, stuck his neck out and made a poster representing one of his very first attempts at um, semiotics and has bravely shared it with us here today. So thank you, Ray, for doing that. You're a completely selfless individual. So Ray's um, poster uses a bottom-up approach to semiotics, which you will see has something in common with the Janta's um, analysis of uh, the way that green is used by brands in India. And um, so Ray is specifically interested in um, the ways that um, analytics agencies use colour and shape to convey um, certain ideas about themselves. Um, it, not surprisingly, perhaps there's quite a lot of blue. It's a colour which is often used to um, convey a certain sobriety and trustworthiness. But what was really interesting insight for me was to learn that um, when these companies are then purchased or they grow, they kind of outgrow um, the, their initial functionality and start to um, diversify, then their colour palettes become broader, uh, softer, more emotional um, elements emerge and start to take over. So here's um, Ray, who's identified some signs and codes. And I would love it, Ray, if you could just tell us, uh, say a few words. How does this help us to know um, which agency is a specialist in analytics? I think, um, thank you, Rachel. And I must say, I feel very humbled following uh, five wonderful presentations. This is very much um, more nitty gritty, I feel, but it's actually really useful to me. So we often know what sort of agency it is when we see it, but we don't know why we know it. And I think that is what in the read along and reading your book has given me some tools to understand why I know 
what I know and therefore to be able to talk to the brands I work with a bit more about what is possible, what is not possible. Um, because there are the, these patterns that re-emerge and it's quite clear this combination of signs that make a code. So some of these things would appear in different agencies, data agencies or consultancies or qualitative, but it's the combination that go that make go from sign to code that can say, right, I can see where you've painted yourself. And then if you look at agencies that have started to change, you get this, this clash where you get the page, which has obviously been done professionally, the home page, which has brought in more tones, more colors, maybe human things or growing things, things that are alive. And then you move into the what we do pages and it goes back to the codes that they feel very comfortable with. And I'm going to find that really useful going forward when I'm talking to organizations to get a sense of where they want to go and feeding back what the challenges will be. Because one of the, the things that struck me is it's okay to break the rules if you know what the rules are. I think this is very interesting work. I agree with what you say about it's easier to break the rules if you know what they are. One of the things that this reminds me of when I look at those images near the bottom of the frame is a situation that I will frequently encounter with clients where they kind of know what they want to say about their brand and maybe they've even done some semiotics previously and they've got the idea that there's a couple of different codes in play in their category. And they'll say to you, well, we're going to redesign all our messaging, you know, and so... We want it to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We want some of this and some of that. We want to combine some of this code with the, some of that code. And they will then kind of agonize about, should we use an equal number of semiotic signs for each? And they'll almost try and develop a kind of mathematical approach to it. You know, like maybe we need two nature signs for every one sign that says technology. My usual advice is that um, rather than trying to reduce it to a kind of mathematical algorithm, it might be better to figure out the one thing that your brand mainly stands for and commit to that. What are, what are your thoughts on that, Ray, given what you now know about semiotics? Um, absolutely. I mean, what I'm really going to be trying next is the semiotic square, because people will often say, well, we're here, we want to be there, so we can set those up in opposition. And that will identify places that are permitted and places that would be really challenging. So that's my next experiment with this really is to set things up in opposition and to try to understand, as I say, this, what is straightforwardly possible and what would have to be quite different to be possible. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Are you going to carry on doing semiotics now? Now you've had um, this experience. Absolutely. Um, and I, very, very much um, link up with what Joanne was saying earlier in that one of the main things I will be doing is actually looking at quantitative information differently. Because hmm. although I do some qualitative and I do some ethnography and now I may do some semiotics too, mostly I do numbers. And there hmm. are additional ways, I need to say better, but that's wrong, additional ways to look at numbers. That's right. Yeah. You say you should definitely do some work with Teresa. I look forward to collaborations between the two of you in the future. <laughs> OK, well, thank you. Thank you, Ray. And thank you so much to all of our, um, our presenters. So I'm just briefly going to say the book that got all of those people off the ground with semiotics was this book right here. It's available on Amazon, Kogan page worldwide and so forth. And it has a step by step self-contained course in semiotics for marketers starting right from scratch so even if i can't be on the phone with you you can hear my voice throughout and you'll be able to do all the same um, activities that this group did and in a matter of a few weeks you'll have posters that are ready to publish too just like these people and so that's the um the end of the kind of formal presentation things let me hand back over to um to ray to um mc the final part of our session uh, which is a discussion thank you ray Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, if the, the panelists all want to unmute themselves, that would be great. If anybody in the audience um, have any specific questions, comments, um, thoughts, please do type them into the chat. We've had one or two very nice uh, comments sent through to the panelists, which is uh, much appreciated. Um, as this, particularly for the people who were earlier in the sequence, like Manisha, um, 
has anything else you've heard today surprised you or given you more ideas to pick up on? Yes, I think I had never thought that quantitative and semiotics would go together. Um, and although I'm a qualitative researcher, but I think just the idea that I could use a semiotic lens in looking at numbers and what that can bring to qualitative practice as well um, is something that's really interesting for me. And I would definitely want to kind of explore that a little bit more. Um, yeah, and look at that. So that, that was something that really stood out and surprised me. Thanks, Manisha. And probably if, if any of the women on the line who are going to speak could say who they are when they start to speak, I think I'm probably the only giveaway voice-wise. So who else would like to chip in? Yeah, I think I have to agree with Manisha. Um, I hadn't really seen um, semiotics as a means of um, translating uh, quant data in this way. It was actually really eye-opening to see how the rest of you did this. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm getting like tingles right now because I'm very excited to try this out in my own work. Absolutely, it's Teresa. Um, yeah, I, I found this a really nice challenge to rise to in terms of looking at the data I'd amassed from my study where I'd asked people about literally every facet of their lives um, back in April and applying it to this, to the, to the data really. And I think for me, it was where I started to see how people were constructing themselves physically in lockdown and how they were reporting it was really fascinating as well. Um, particularly where elsewhere I had data that, that told me that men were grooming themselves more than usual in lockdown and actually women were grooming themselves less in lockdown mm. and when you look at the fact that a lot more women especially with children were taking on childcare responsibilities as well as work in many cases right. you know you start to get this bigger picture of you know just what's what's happening in terms of representations and in terms of kind of how we're portraying ourselves when we're spending more time at home and if that is either a choice by the male respondents to go out to work or if it's actually something that's been placed on them to put themselves out there and grooming and telling everyone that they're fine becomes part of that. It just really made me get deeper into the psyche of the people that took the, the, date, the um, research. Super, now we have a question um, that's been sent in. So what did people find the natural easiest and what was the most challenging in taking these steps into semiotics? Um, it's Joanne here from Canada. Actually, the, the existence of the data or the images was easy because I took my phone and I started to photograph. And so finding uh, the images, easy, I now have thousands of images. What I found then in contrast though is uh, settling down to stare at the images and begin to say, uh, to break it down into the different um, pieces, quotes of the method. And, and that took me, and, I, and I were, it took me actually weeks to actually settle down and say, this is step by step, break it apart, and then put it back together. But collecting the data, there's so much around us that can be observed. And COVID has created so many new opportunities. We're doing different things, and I find I'm seeing different things. Well, Ajanta here. Uh, coming down to this particular question, as far as India was concerned, we always knew, you know, about colors and uh, signs and symbols. So when I just got to know about it, my first question was, does it really work in India? Do people in India really know about it? And Rachel was so good in telling me, yes, of course it does work. So it was very easy for me to understand how it works, but it was very difficult for me to really go deeper, get the insights from them and actually predict how important it would really be for a brand to actually attract consumers and divert them by virtue of its colors and symbols. This was amazing. And I'm seriously looking forward to more and more of exploration, understanding and experiencing. Thanks a bunch for this. Um, if I can sort of add to that uh, a response to that question, 
for me, what I found was it was an aspect of unlearning because mm. uh, once I look at um, pictures, the, te the immediate response is kind of, you know, begin to classify that data. But semiotics is not about classification, as I learned from uh, Rachel, right? It's, and, and so to really kind of uh, get out of that mindset and to look at what you've got in a very different way, um, yeah, I think that for me was the most difficult piece in it. And I think yeah, hey there. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. You, you first. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so Chloe again. Um, so I think the easiest thing for me was um, sort of like Joanne said, the, the collection of the actual data um, and the reporting on the actual data saying, like, this is what I found, you know, like, this is the pattern that I've seen. Because that's, you know, part and parcel of the work that I already did. Um, I think the thing where um, things clicked and shifted and there it need, required some growth was definitely explaining the why of what I was seeing, right? Like, it's one thing to say that I see this particular pattern of, of colors, for example, um, and ostensibly what they mean, but why those particular colors, you know, why um, in the particular orientation that they had, you know, why, like who benefited from this particular image, you know, like that was sort of the switch that I needed to make and it, it took a bit of growth. So I think it was probably the most challenging bit. And I think for me, the issue was about getting my focal length right, how much detail mm. was I going to look at. So um, mm. in terms of the available time, not looking at the whole industry and then not um, trying to find every example and trying to find a theory that linked everything I saw, but actually talked about the the patterns and, and together and then looking a bit more deeply so looking at blue and saying well it's not actually about being cold it's something else it's to do with objectivity and then mm. looking at one of the things that crops up an awful lot in the websites and the materials from these people are spaces between things so they identify things in circles and squares and rectangles very occasionally triangles a lot but they're really keen to have a space between them. And that, ex I think, expresses quite a lot about the, the way they see the world and they have discrete solutions and problems are discrete um, and should be brought forward. And when you start seeing that, you can see that it, it's a really common combination of signs that make this code. And that was useful for me once I got, as I say, my focal length right. I wasn't looking too wide and I wasn't looking too deep. I, I've absolutely loved hearing everybody's commentary. It's been such a pleasure to work with all of you over the weeks and to see everybody's skills emerging so rapidly <laughs> and then resulting in these wonderful posters at the end. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we're, we're about out of time. And so I want to say thank you. You've all been wonderful. And I hope that everybody's going to continue making semiotics and uh, unleashing it on the world. And you can too, listeners. If, uh, as you can see, um, if you um, read the book, follow the exercises, and you too will be um, able to publish your own work in semiotics before much too much time has elapsed. Thank you, Rachel, um, and thank you all panellists. We'll just move to the thank you and the wrap-up. One thing um, I would say about the book, another good reason, is a lot of the advice from Rachel actually applies to pretty much every type of research. So there's a whole a, a theme which comes back two or three times about don't describe what you see, describe why people are doing it and what effect it has and what the implications are. Um, and I see this cropping up so often. People say these were the these were the numbers, these were the verbatims, these were the pictures that people took with their smartphone. Fine, but the book talks a lot about how you might start to make sense out of all of those too. So with that, um, you can support us by being a Patreon. You can support us by being a sponsors. But 
please, please do look at the book. Please do write um, a comment about the book in the Amazon page um, because that helps spread the word and do look after each other. Thank you very much for attending and thank you panel and Rachel.